sorry. I'm interested in um, your opinion of writers' rooms. I think uh, in England it's not so common, and in America it's it's it's, mm. it's awfully common. And when you think what kind of show you think suits a writers' room, or where in the process that might work, or if you're just against them altogether. Um, I'm, not, I'm not against them at all. I, th I think they, they can work brilliantly. Um, England has this very theatrical tradition, which goes back to the previous question, which is, you know, the, it, it, it was built out of the culture of the lone genius in the garret suffering on our behalf um, to bring us art. And whereas in America, that, there was none of that. It's, it's money-making. It's about making money. Um, and they both have something to offer, I think. You know, and you can see in the particular kinds of work those two countries have produced. The only reason in recent years why England hasn't adopted writers' rooms is just economic, because it's just not economically viable to pay all those writers to be in a room for that long. Um, but I've sat, I've, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to sit in the writers' room of Buffy the Vampire Slayer a few years ago, and I was just like, this is amazing. This is so brilliant. Why has nobody thought of these? You know, so I, I love them. I think, you know, again, it's down to the showrunner and how good the showrunner Yes, but they can be great. Mm. So. And the showrunner is presumably the genius in that. In all, well, theoretically, all yeah, theoretically. But it, you know, it's about someone who knows how to motivate a team and get the best out of the team, who knows when to ask for help and when not to. It's all those skills, you know. But they also have to be the best writer mm. in the room, or when they're not, acknowledge that they're not, yeah. which is tricky yeah. sometimes, you know. But you need to surround yourself with geniuses, yeah. basically, and that's quite hard. For some writers, because they don't want to be threatened. Yes, just behind Sam Strauss up the back there. Can I just pick up on the question about writers' rooms? Then, mm. in in the UK, sort of, would you plot it all by yourself and then write it all by yourself, or do you bring writers in to 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 the room? How does how does that it depends what the show is. So, you know, if it's a long-running, what you would call serial, we would call sort of continuing drama, like Casualty, that, that would be a group of writers plotting the, the, the season, and they'd all sit in a room together and do it like that. So on the continuing shows, shows that run all year, you can do that because you can afford to do that. But I did a series with Peter Moffat a couple of years ago, The Village, and there was no plan. I mean, it was terrifying. We just said, oh, we'll make it up. Uh, and we started filming, and he'd only written the first episode. And it was terrifying. Um, so what's going to happen next? I was like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, he's a genius, thank God. And what he turned up with was actually pretty good, I think. But, but it's not a sensible way to make television, you know, really. Economically, it's challenging, I think. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's, there's loads of different ways of doing it. I think now people are becoming more aware of in the basic storylining process, you, know, you should get all the writers in the room just because you need to talk to them. You know, they need to know what you're thinking. It seems to be very important. Hi, just wondering, because um, obviously you're talking about TV, American TV at the moment seems to be doing so much better than American film. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if the British TV will ever get as good as that. I know we mentioned Broad Church and that was really good, but... If you talk about like House of Cards, it sounds like 22 episodes and mm. everyone is stuck and glued to it. And I mm. think typically for a British film or British TV, it's always like eight episodes or whatever. Yeah. I just recently finished uh, Inside Man by the BBC. Oh, yeah. Great, great actors, great opening episode. Mm. And then it just deteriorated. It only had four episodes in it and it ended so <laughs> abruptly. And I don't understand why it feels like the BBC and British TV in general can't commit to having trust their audience to commit to that longer period. Just wondering if British TV will ever reach. Uh, well, it's it's a it's again it's a financial. It's, it, it's purely you know the BBC particularly is licensed to be funded, so they have to be really careful. Uh, you know, they have committed to episode, to runs of ten, but if they go wrong, it's not like they're so exposed because <laughs> everyone can see they're failing. Everybody sees the audience figures. The press dive in. This way, nobody knows how many people watch a show on Netflix. You know, that's amazing. How to not tell anybody your audience figures. How do they get away with that? Yeah, I think that's, that's the difference, is, 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 is terrestrial is a very different medium. And it's supposed, but, you know, there are still great shows on British television. I mean, it, well, say the House of Cards, it was a BBC show. You know, that, that's where it came from. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking back last year, Happy Valley, um, and if you've got that here, Amazing program, wonderful program. So they still do it. It's just you know we're a really small country. It's like yourselves, you know. It's like you know, 
we have to punch above our weight the whole time. But they are a monster machine. And now that Hollywood has gone, oh, telly, you know, that's really difficult to compete with. You know, I think, you know, over time it will level out because there's, there's almost too much TV being made. There's too much for people to watch, I think. And a lot of people won't make money out of it and it will calm down a bit. Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> <laughs> I say that. But it's very exciting. I think it's very, yeah, it's exciting, you know, you know, discovering that, that sounds ridiculous, other countries make great drama. You know, that's phenomenal. Some great stuff out of Israel recently, yeah. and of course Scandi. Yeah, amazing have made stuff. an industry of it themselves. Yeah, Ireland as well. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Joe. Um, I guess one of the things you brought up but didn't really dwell much on is repetition in those series. Mm. I think one of the things that um, becomes a problem or in making new shows is you only have these certain playing fields: medical, law, police, yeah. and then of course within that you have the heroes and. Uh, there's a resistance to having people who are more flawed. Yeah. And I just wondered how we go ahead um, creating series that are long-lasting and long-running mm. um, and yet don't fall into this repetitious pattern. It's really hard if you're looking for a, a, a show that returns every week. I think it's, you know, the series form by its nature is, is, is conservative. But uh, you, know, you go back to... Hill Street Blues again, and you go back to ER and West Wing, arguably, it's either all American, but you know, you see there's an ambition there. You know, you see they're incredibly well written. You know, in the end, they die, they run out of steam themselves. But I think, you know, that's down to the genius of the showrunners and the production company, but also the bravery of the broadcaster. You know, you know broadcasters are by their nature conservative because they have to be, because they, they can't go broke, you know, but you have to. You know, what you, you have to present an argument to a broadcaster whereby this is a worthwhile investment. This will make you money. And it's creating a climate where that goes, whether it's talent, you know, whether it's the idea. Normally it's a combination of both. But it's hard. You know, I mean, terrestrial TV, by its nature, you know, fights against artistic genius. You know, it's a, but that doesn't mean it can't thrive there. It just needs the right people coming together to be brave. John, um, just to going back to the questions of structure, is one of the challenges that you have when you talk about structure a lot, and there's lots of books about structure, is you can make or you can write a lot of stuff which has pure structure but is actually as boring as yeah. dishwater. Yeah. So that's possibly one of the reasons why there's a lot of resistance from people who are good writers yeah. to the idea of focusing on structure because anyone can learn structure but not necessarily mean they can be creative potentially. Yeah. So that's, that was just a kind of Absolutely, question. Absolutely, no, very true, yeah. Yeah. Yes, up the back. Um, I have a question from someone that's streaming in. With the rise of Netflix and catch-up viewing of serials like Breaking Bad, how do you think five nights a week soaps will need to change to remain a compelling choice for viewers? I think it's, re it's good. very good question. I think it's really hard. I mean, I really didn't talk about soaps tonight because it's, there's, a, there's certain other uh, structural things that we just didn't feel like right to go into. But I think soaps are really suffering in the UK. I think you know, there's a massive drop-off in audience figures. You know, uh, 20 years ago, EastEnders was getting 20 million. Now it gets 6, 7 million. Uh, same with Coronation Street. I think, I, think it's, I think it's really hard. I think the only way around it for them is they have to be brilliant and they have to be invested in. Uh, and you know, I had this argument five years ago on EastEnders when I said to the controller of BBC One, I said, you've got to put more money into it because the competition is so much greater now. And, you know, nobody has to watch it anymore. So every episode has to be brilliant. You can't ever let the audience down. And, you know, in the end, we did get some more money, but it was a, it was a struggle um, because, you know, there's, people don't look at a crisis until it's happened. You know, and I think you know, with those shows, and if you want those shows to continue here, you know, I pour money into them. I would get the best talent, the best people, and invest in the future because that, in the end, is you know, people watch things because they love them and turn them off because they're bored. And so you've got to make a show that people love because it's great all the time. And I think that, but I think it is a real struggle. Um, so yeah, soaps. Really, I mean, I've worked a lot in soap, and I love it. But the idea that you can now ever take the audience for granted. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, when I first started, about 25 years ago, South East Ends, my first week, 
uh, and went for lunch with the team. And, and we were chatting, and I was saying, what do you think of the show? I said, oh, it's all right. No, none of them were very excited about the show. Uh, and I said, well, why, why aren't you more excited? And he said, well, you know, look at this. And they put the list of the episodes coming up, and there were like three weeks of episodes, four weeks of episodes. That's the next good episode. And it was like four weeks away. Uh, and you go, how can you think like that? It's your job to make them good. And they didn't... They, the, the culture that existed then, this was a long time ago, was people will watch it anyway because it's all there is and they love the characters. The rule everyone's learned is they don't. You know, not now they don't, so you've got to fight. You know. But the, the trouble so does why it goes wrong is they go, oh, no, we need to be sensational. You know, we have no viewers. Let's drop a helicopter on them. You know, um, hilariously in Britain, the Brookside was subject to a, a flesh-eating killer virus. This was a, 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 a suburban, you know, like neighbours, like yep. yeah, estate, you know, and yeah, that doesn't. The viewers will come and watch, and they'll go, "You're you're ridiculous, and you're insulting my intelligence," and they'll turn off. You know, you just have to be good. You know, they just have to characters people love, and situations you empathise with. Never take the audience for granted. Never yeah. take the audience for granted. Ever. Five minutes. Any other questions? I've got a quick one. Do you think consuming, as we do now, box sets, mm. um, do you think that is going to change the way we will structure episodes? Is there a danger of, uh, of a sense of repetition if you're, if you're viewing it? I mean, you're never going to know how your audience is going to consume it because that's obviously their choice. I think, you know, I mean, it's interesting the way that Netflix now programs it, so you immediately flicks to the exactly. next episode. You just keep going. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know... The fundamental laws of structure will always be the same. And then the fundamental law of, like, you know, it's Ian Foster who said, you know, a good story is one where you want to know what happens next, mm. and a bad story is one where you don't care. That's it. Uh, and so fundamentally that will apply. And I think, you know, I mean, there was lots of stuff about, all oh, House of Cards, we don't do cliffhangers. But they do, and they did. And you do. It's about deferring uh, gratification, isn't it? It's always about deferral of gratification. Uh, and I think that governing principle will be the same, you know, if you can do 22 episodes and keep them watching and tell a complete story at that time, then that's fantastic. It's very hard to do. Yeah. Really hard. Yes, Keith. Thanks. Um, you spoke about um, your, you loving the, the characters in Hill Street Blues and mm. people loving the, the characters in East End. And I know that... Um, structure can help define a character and, and give them mm. a journey but what's the magic in finding that character in the first place that kind of sits outside oh. the structure what why do we love characters what what is it about those characters that make us engage with them oh god or, i wish i knew i'd be really rich um or, or is that what the individual writer brings i think it observation over the years is if you don't love them nobody else will you have to love them with all your heart. The more I look at individual writers, the more I see that they always tell versions of the same story. It's the same thing again and again. You know, there's one writer who I love in England called Sasha Hales, who always writes the, story, the same story, which is, I'm a terrible mother. You know, and she becomes a good mother. And, and, and she has th three kids. And she's a great mum. But she spent her whole life thinking she's a terrible mum. So it's that thing of... of I think great characters... Like structure come from there, and they they spell out true dilemmas, true internal conflicts, and put them on a way that everybody else goes, "Oh my God, I felt that," or "I want to feel that." You know, it's it's that really. I think if you try to reduce it any more scientifically than that, it becomes a bit tricky. I mean, great characters are always conflicted. You can say that, I think, but apart from that, um, it's it's very hard. Um, but I think if they, even on that list of successful series I did, you look at it, they, you know, they are, all of those central heroes are idealisations of the showrunner. You know, really, you know, President Bartler is Aaron Sorkin, you know, writ large, you know, that's how he wants the world to be. And it's, it's kind of their love letters to yourself, Rick. Really. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nicer way to say it than you could, but yes, very good. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from... I think we've really come to the to the end and it's time to have a drink and
tell stories outside. Thank you so much, John. That was really fantastic. Thank you.